morning. In the interest of time, I think we should get started. Uh, this morning, it's my great pleasure to present Dr. Peter Carroll, uh, professor and chair of UCSF Department of Urology. Uh, Peter uh, did his undergraduate training at University of California, Berkeley, uh, and he majored in zoology, I think. And uh, um, later, uh, he went to Georgetown uh, and finished uh, Georgetown University School of Medicine with honors and then came back to UCSF and uh, did general surgery and urology residency. And uh, following that, went to Memorial Sloan Kettering for urologic oncology fellowship, and then returned back to UCSF as faculty and has been there since then. Uh, Dr. Carroll holds the Ken and Donna, uh, their Chevron distinguished uh, professorship in urology and he recently also added uh, an MPH degree to his credentials. And he was also awarded the coveted uh, Behringer Medal from the American Association of Gentle Urinary Surgeons. Uh, Dr. Carroll has uh, published more than 500 papers and numerous uh, NIH and DOD grants. Uh, he serves in the editorial boards of uh, uh, Journal of Urology, Journal of Clinical Oncology, and many uh, other journals, Prostate. Um, uh, he has reward, uh, received many awards and uh, numerous uh, memberships in international organizations, and he has also mentored uh, uh, many faculty, one of uh, which is uh, our own, Dr. Viraj Master, who's uh, uh, one of his uh, mentees, and uh, also in my previous institution when I was at Wayne State, I worked with Michael Scher, uh, who is now the, the chairman of the Department of Urology there, who was also trained by Dr. Carroll. That's uh, when I first met Dr. Carroll in 1999 in Detroit when he came to give the uh, a professorship talk. Uh, there's uh, a prestigious professorship talk that, that, that they have every year in the urology department and he was uh, our speaker. Uh, after that, you know, over the years, uh, I have been uh, following his work in active surveillance. Uh, he's done a lot of work in, in that area and prevention and prediction of uh, aggressive cancers. Uh, he's uh, uh, also in the operating room. He has uh, uh, developed new techniques uh, he's been very passionate about uh, reducing prostate cancer morbidity and mortality and burden on the population. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Carroll. Yeah. Omar, thank you very much. It's a, a really a, a pleasure and honor to be here and to see Viraj Master. Uh, I knew I came from somewhere different than California last night for two big reasons, one of which was raining. And I've never seen so much rain in California. And the second thing is the driver who was driving me into the, uh, here to the uh, hotel said, would you believe that house over there cost $500,000? <laughs> a big house, big brick house. And, and in, in San Francisco, a 2,000 foot condo is $1.7 million. So I knew I'd come somewhere, somewhere else. Uh, you know, prostate cancer is a worldwide disease. I think we in, in the United States kind of focus on the United States. But worldwide, uh, prostate cancer mortality is increasing by about 41%. So I think we, we have to be a little bit more broad-minded and think about prostate cancer as a worldwide disease. And this is what I think for 2016. I'm going to show you some themes here. I'll go through these quickly over the next uh, several minutes. But the, the negative public pressure on PSA early detection may be tempered, but it will not go away. Uh, we'll see increased use of novel technology to decrease biopsy rates. Hopefully, we'll see that prostate cancer is a spectrum of disease influenced by a host and tumor microenvironment. Active surveillance, although widely recognized now as a relatively safe option, will be challenged by focal therapy, which is kind of coming out rather rapidly right now. And the treatment of high-risk disease will be better personalized due to use of advanced imaging and molecular medicine. I'll give you some examples of both of those. 
So someone asked, asked me to talk about technology. This, this is a, a cover from Life magazine, which used to have a, a big circulation in 1961. And the title of this magazine was, in, in 61, is a surgeon pits his skill against cancer. It's notable because I put his, his in capital there because in my program, one third of my faculty are women and more than one half of my residents are women right now. So you would not get away with a title like that nowadays. But fast focus to, a, you know, I'm a very busy surgeon like Marty and Barrage. Fast forward from 61 to now when we're using robot technology. But technology will change, but good sense should not. So again, if we introduce new technology, we should use it very, very wisely. Uh, I th the issue about PSA testing saving lives is going to go away, okay? Because there's no question the evidence shows that doing PSA testing, biopsying at a PSA cut point of 2.5 to 3 saves lives. The only argument is how many lives. And, um, you know, the task force, which is redoing their uh, recommendation on prostate cancer, made the recommendations based on a lot of flawed methodology, and they included the PCLO, PLCO trial. And of course, we all know now that in that trial, the US trial, which was negative, that the contamination rates are actually very high. So looking at the control group, 90% of people in the control group got PSA testing. This was just reported by Jim Hugh, again, showing the, the, the fact that that is not a good trial. We've done, it was well-intentioned, but not a good trial. Too, too high contamination rate. In my mind, this trial just showed you that you, only, you didn't need to do PSA testing every year. That in fact, the ad hoc testing in two to four years would do as well. So I think the task force will take this into account. And again, this is the, the uh, European trial showing that over time, 9, 11, 13 years, the benefit to PSA testing improves over time. And this is important to realize that any, anything that looks at prostate cancer, you cannot look at the first eight to nine years. Again, I'm talking about clinically localized disease. You have to look at nine, 12, uh, 14, or 15 years, whether it be for early detection or treatment. And if you look at the number needed to treat, uh, number needed to detect, you know, we all remember when this trial first came out, it was said you need, need to invite 1,400 men for screening, you need to detect 48 to save one life. As you look over time, those numbers improve significantly. And in fact, many people think they're even better than shown here. So these are the recommendations uh, from the AUA and Task Force, ACS, NCCN. They're, they're all a bit uh, different right here about when to start screening, when to discourage screening. Uh, but again, we, we still have to get over this uh, grade D recommendation. Again, the, the task force reached out to me about a year ago. They showed me their methodology. It seems appropriate. It would be hard, I'd be hard pressed to see another grade D recommendation, but we have to wait and see what they have to say. Now, this is an important point that they used in, when they looked at uh, PSA testing. In fact, I think the grade D recommendation came out to some extent because of the concerns that it may not save many lives but in fact, it carried a lot of morbidity with it. And this is the pictogram they used. So this was 1,000 US men. They thought uh, that you would only save zero to one life, but there was a lot of morbidity with over, over treatment. I really did this slide, and the benefits, they, they underestimated the benefits. When I look at it right now, the number, if you screen a thousand, if, if, if you don't screen a thousand, if you don't screen, look at a thousand US men, between nine and 12 will die of disease. If you screen them and biopsy them, you'll decrease that number about five to six. So I think the number of live saves will be about five. Now this is an important number because I think a lot of urologists and radiation oncologists talk about risk reduction. You know, the relative risk is reduced, but they don't talk about the actual numbers. So we don't want to, we don't want to overestimate its impact. The problem, of course, is when you screen these thousand men, you'll get 130 negative biopsies, 120 biopsies. If you go ahead and treat these men using active surveillance rates at around 40%, 35 will develop bladder bowel or sexual side effects. We had eight complications of biopsy. The death rates, again, overestimated by the task force will be less than one. So we went from, a, a, I think, an era where we detected all, we detected all, we treated all. This was when we had the, the late 90s, early 2000s, where we had heavy and repeated screening. There was no deferred treatment. I was a big advocate for the next decade when we detect, again, we have, we have a lot of screening being done, but we treat very selectively. So you screen widely, treat very selectively. 
I think the next decade will, is there's going to be a big emphasis on avoiding the detection of low-risk disease. So we'll detect some and we'll treat some. I think that's what we're going forward with. This was a nice model uh, done by Ruth Etzioni, who, who's uh, in Washington. And she looked at a micro-simulation model of testing and treatment. So again, this is looking quality-adjusted lives saved. And what was notable uh, on this, and you can, this is a busy slide, but what she did is she, she looked at the, the, these 22 various PSA screening strategies. And she looked at the screening ages, you know, target population, the intervals, and the PSA threshold at which to, to do a biopsy, and whether or not you, you would do active surveillance. And she found that, in fact, that you will, the, the, for quality-adjusted life years saved, you actually had to do several things. The target population had to be 59 to 69. The screening interval, four years. The PSA threshold at which to do a biopsy was 10. Uh, and you had to do uh, selective treatment. Uh, so what I think we're going to right now is that uh, the target population it's generally said 50 to 70. There is no question in my mind. There's a strong rationale to start screening at age 45. A single PSA at eight, between 45 and 50 is a strong predictor of the future risk of getting prostate cancer and the future risk of getting lethal prostate cancer. Now, the AUA guidelines said go ahead and screen early in only men at high risk of having disease. So this is people of uh, African American men or men with a family history. But a baseline PSA trumps family history and ethnicity. So no, if you really want to detect high-risk patients, get a single PSA at, at 45. Of course, if it's below one, get another one at 50. There'll be more stringent indications for biopsy. You can do one or two things. You can increase the cut point, as I'll show you. Another way to do it is increase specificity for PSA testing. You need to use higher, there has to be, and Omar, I know you don't like surveillance, but you have to have a high use of active surveillance to make PSA testing work. You, you can't do PSA testing if you don't acknowledge uh, the risk of overtreatment. And this, like at Emory, I think that high volume centers uh, have great expertise. You need to refer patients to high volume centers. So uh, I chair the NCCA guidelines panel for early detection of prostate cancer, and this has been updated. I think NCCN is, is more balanced than the AUA uh, approach, more nuanced. Uh, and gave stronger indications for when to do a biopsy. So again, I always point out that the only randomized trials that showed a benefit to PSA testing used a PSA cut point of 2.5 to 3 for biopsy. So that, we have good evidence that that works. The key now, of course, is we're considering that maybe uh, to reduce the unnecessary biopsy rates, you can use other things like the 4K score or prostate health index. These are just variations on PSA, looking at PSA and isoforms. And so for first biopsy, this is free PSA, PCA3, prostate health index of 4K. The latter two actually do better than the, 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 the earlier two. For repeat biopsy, there's another thing you can do. But again, I think what people are going to do is going to use these tests. So who's got an elevated PSA, you want to confirm it. Again, you want to be sure that you don't make a decision based on a single PSA, confirm it. And uh, I think what we'll do is we'll be, and this is another test that I was author on, that the urinary exosome does not require to do rectal examination. It's the same thing. By using these tests, you reduce biopsy rates by 20 to 40 percent, and you maintain largely the specificity for the detection of higher risk disease. So again, we get these 4K scores, where it tells you what is the risk of having Gleason 3, 4, or greater disease. So again, getting away from the detection of low risk disease. MRI, you know, it amazes me. You know, endorectal MR imaging was developed at UCSF. We've been continuously funded. Uh, over the last 20 years to look at MRI. We've done over 8,000 MRIs. I'm simply amazed how much enthusiasm there has been for MRI despite a lack of good, well-validated studies looking at MRI. Uh, in this paper from NCI, I showed that if you use an MR-targeted biopsy, what you do is the overall detection rates compared to a systematic biopsy are the same, but you detected more higher risk patients and fewer lower risk patients by using MR targeting. And, and again, this just shows all the series to date, pretty much showing the same thing. And our results look pretty much the same. But I'll show you some nuances with regard to this. The, the, the other important point about MR, what I'm showing you here is our experience with MR targeted biopsy, systematic biopsy, or a combination, and how will they predict outcome at the time of radical prostatectomy. 
and all of them have limitations, but only by using, doing both MR targeted and systematic biopsies do you do the best job predicting outcome. Again, for the pathologist, what we have to worry a little bit about now is we're finding that if you look here, this over, this is downgrade, this is uh, upgrade, and no change at radical prostatectomy. There's a substantial uh, downgrading that occurs at the time of radical prostatectomy because what we always do is we always grade the cancer by the, the, the Gleason score of the highest biopsy. So you can have a 3 3, 3 4, 4 3, and that pa patient carries that 4 3 diagnosis. So you're overestimating risk. And again, that's why we kind of advocate for what we call a quantitative Gleason score. Now, we only do two cores of the target lesion. I don't know what you're doing here, but I get a little bit worried now. I'm seeing a lot of patients who want to go MR targeting and get five, seven cores taken from the target. If you do that, you overestimate volume and risk. So I think what we'll go to is that we'll get an elevated PSA. And in NCCN guidelines, I want to point out that we made digital rectal examination optional. Uh, to, to a lot of digital rectal examination does not do very well as a screening test. It's a major barrier to screening in many patient populations. So it's a, in my mind, it's optional. If you have an elevated PSA, you need to confirm it, number one. Uh, do a digital rectal examination. If the DRE is negative, then I think we're moving more towards the serum tests before we go to the MRI. I think that's in your economic model that you talk about. I think what you need to look at is, no one's really looked at is, is looking at the serum test as a screen for the MRI. You know, in Europe, an MRI costs $450. At UCSF, it costs up to $6,000. So I'm not sure you should lead with an MR. My sense is one of these serum tests may be the best way to go. One thing I'm a big advocate for is we, stop, we have to stop dichotomizing prostate cancer. We, you know, we call it's, the urologists generally call it significant versus insignificant based on age-old feelings about volume and grade. And it's like falling off a cliff. You know, we say that if you have more than three biopsies positive, or you ever have any pattern four, you have significant disease and need to be treated. And we have to stop being held hostage by grade. Uh, I know we have a pathologist in the room, but, but I tell you, we, we get into this argument all the time. And so I think what we need to do is we need to go to better risk assessment. You can use everything, you know, there's a, several ways to do this. The D'Amico low intermediate and high risk or the AUA low intermediate and high risk does not do a good job in the intermediate and high risk categories. I don't like it at all. It, 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 it overestimates risk. Low risk does a pretty good job. But th this is a UCSF capper. Again, the world didn't need another risk assessment tool, but it didn't stop us from creating one at UCSF. It's actually easy to do. No, the, no pen and paper, no, no computer, you know, 0 through 10, based on PSA, Gleason score, T stage, percent positive biopsy, age. This has been validated around the world in tens of thousands of patients, both in the US, Asia, uh, the Americas, and in Europe. And it does a very good job predicting this biochemical-free survival after surgery or radiation therapy. It actually is one of the few tools that actually predicts prostate cancer-specific death and it predicts overall survival. And this was a surprise to me, is why would a risk assessment tool for prostate cancer predict overall survival? And I think what it's telling me is maybe the way we treat men with advanced disease may have an impact on non-prostate death. You know, so car, you know, hormonal therapy and cardiac disease, uh, bone marrow density changes, things like this. Uh, there's a big move by pathologists now to go to this, you know, this uh, new grading system, three, four, you know, uh, th three, three or less, three, four, 4344, Gleason 45. We just tested this in uh, Capture, which is a large disease registry which we manage. And it performs reasonably well, but I want to show you that down here, if you look at the low risk 333443, these are not statistically significant from one another. And that worries me a bit because I think it's telling us a little bit about the, the amount of pattern four actually is more important than having pattern four. At UCSF, whether you had a 33 or 34 at the time of prostatectomy makes no difference in outcome. So in our experience, low volume pattern four actually performs as like, like a pattern three. This is in press, actually. Uh, and now again, the other thing is we can, we can turn to new technology. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to say anything negative about pathology or radiation oncology, but it always amazes me that we have these, we have these uh, complex patterns on microscopy or we do an MRI, which is a lot of technology, and we put it in front of someone and they give it like a zero through five pyrad score. It just, it seems to me we need to do something that's 
that's, that's, has more technology. And, and of course, we're seeing a lot, of course, along the entire spectrum of disease, either pre-biopsy, after biopsy, pre-treatment, post-treatment, and both for advanced disease. Surveillance, you know, I came to surveillance, you know, I'm, one of, I'm a very busy surgeon like Marty. I've done over 4,000 radical prostatectomies. I do a lot of them nowadays, but I do them on men who I think benefit from it. Uh, and I, about 15, uh, 20 years ago, I started to see the, the, this whole wave of overdetection occurring, which really caused me to pause. It's been good for patients at UCSF on active surveillance, and it's, I tell you, it's been a great, it's driven our research, our funded research, very, very well. And the idea about surveillance is, is to avoid or delay. It's more about timing of treatment. You need to treat a patient right now. I see a lot of men in their 40s who got you know, biopsied serendipitously, have low-grade disease, haven't completed their families. The key is, do you do them harm by watching them and treating them very selectively over the next five to 15 years? These are our results now. We have over 1,600 patients. This is 370 have been followed over time. And this is a treatment-free survival. Good rule of thumb is about one-third required treatment by five years, about 50% by 10 years, usually because you see a change in Gleason grade. And I'm also showing you here, this is Gleason 3.3, and 3-4 disease. So these are low volume, 3-4, behave very similar if everything else is equal to 3-3 disease. 98% uh, overall survival, 100% prostate cancer specific survival. Obviously this is not 15 or 20 years, but with an, with an average fall up of six to seven years, the data looks pretty good. And when we look at the, the we look at a change in, when we look at the magnitude of change on biopsy, this is again looking at CAPRA scores, uh, uh, and any biopsy that you do, about 20% about will be negative, repeat biopsy, 20% will be negative, and about 20% will show upgrading. By and large, these are very minor forms of upgrading at very few points to, um, to the CAPRA score. But there's a small number of patients will see more significant, you know, 8 to 12% will see more significant change in biopsy or volume. The controversies in active surveillance right now are this issue of younger age, and a lot of series exclude young patients from surveillance. So in series like Hopkins, they'll have 10%. At UCSF, 50% of our patients are young, less than age 60. So we actually have not excluded young patients. Gleason 3-4 disease, I'm hearing at the AUA now, a lot of national leaders say don't uh, do surveillance in 3-4 disease. This whole issue about African-American men, driven by uh, really one series. So this is, we actually looked at this initially, and this is in press under review at JCO, and actually younger men do better in active surveillance. So they have lower upgrading rates, and there's no, no adverse outcomes in bio, for those who go to surgery biochemical-free survival rates. So actually younger patients, similar to what we see uh, in general, do better than older patients in active surveillance. So we think these patients are candidates for active surveillance. Uh, African-American men candidates for surveillance, I, people have come at me on this one, and um, there's no question that African-American men suffer a higher prostate cancer burden than other groups. They're, they're underrepresented in landmark uh, uh, active surveillance cohorts. I think at UCSF, it's like only 10% of our population. And in one series from Hopkins, they, see, they showed significantly higher rates of pathologic upgrading and upstaging men who were thought to have low-risk disease, African-American who thought to have low-risk disease who underwent surgery. And this created a, a, a large call for excluding African-American men for active surveillance. And we have data now, again, this is UCSF data from two large uh, data sets, search and capture, again, national data sets, over 8,000 patients, showing that African-American race was not associated with upgrade or upstage, uh, or risk of biochemical recurrence after radical prostatectomy compared to Caucasian men. So we think this is an unresolved issue. African-American men are candidates for surveillance. They should be uh, well advised about the risks and benefits of this, but we don't think they should be excluded from active surveillance simply based on ethnicity. Uh, and this whole issue of Gleason 3-4 disease, again, I've showed you that 3-4 uh, at UCSF, they perform similar to 3-3. So we actually looked at this issue of, again, the most common indication for surgery on surveillance is an upgrade. So we looked at the biochemical-free surveillance rates in those who had surgery for 3-4 disease right away versus those who underwent surveillance for 3-3 disease were found to have 3-4 disease and underwent surgery. I've done over about 280 patients who have been on surveillance who have undergone surgery, and there was no difference between immediate and delayed radical prostatectomy. So we think 
the best we can tell, surveillance is safe. Now, if I, tell a, I always tell a patient that if you want to bear no risk, go ahead and be treated. But if you're willing to bear what appears to be a very, very small risk, uh, consider active surveillance. If we make it safer, you know, we don't need a lot of technology. Every time we look at this, a very strong, the strongest predictor of upgrading at biopsy is PSA density. Every time we do this, it shows, so PSA density below 0.15 predicts for non-progression, 0.1 or less even better. So again, you don't need to use genetic profiling, just simply look at PSA density. MRI, you know, every person who, who uh, talks about MRI always shows an anterior lesion that was missed. These are about 10% of the cases we see. Uh, and so I'm showing you one here. Again, it's an anterior lesion missed from a biopsy done in the posterior lateral region of the prostate. But these are relatively rare, only about 10% of cases. Um, so we've actually looked at, we have the largest series of uh, MR-directed biopsies and active surveillance. And again, we take two biopsies from the target. And we looked at actually MR, few, and this is uh, under review at the European Urology. Uh, we looked at MR fusion and systematic biopsy, and to cut to the chase, both perform reasonably well, but they pick up different higher grade cancers. And if you had a policy of doing MR guided biopsies alone, you'd miss about 14% of higher risk disease. So we think at least early on, you should do MR directed and systematic biopsies. Over time, maybe MR directed alone will be of value. But early on, the first biopsy a patient has uh, should, should be systematic and MR targeted, and if uh, you're doing surveillance to a patient who has not had the combination approach, do both. The only thing on MR that we've been able to show that predicts outcome on surveillance is a negative MRI. So if you have a negative MRI, it predicts for non-progression. But anything else, we have not found that PIRED score actually correlates very well with Gleason grade. And again, we do a lot of these. We have shown that serial imaging with ultrasound predicts outcome. Again, but I work with a great sonographer, Katsuru Shinohara, who for eyes remembers, great sonographer, that serial ultrasound uh, was a strong predictor of progression. So if you saw a change in ultrasound, that patient had higher risk disease. And our early results with MRI suggest similarly that if you have an MRI showing a change in volume or pyrese, that patient's also at risk. What about tissue-based gene expression? Again, there's several different tests. We've done validation studies with all of them, you know, Oncotype, uh, Decipher, Prolaris. I think they all work reasonably well. I think we, we, we will know, if we have a large DOD grant where we're comparing them, we'll, we'll know which one might be better or not. But what I'm showing you here is if you look at the, these are patients who had low risk disease on biopsy. I took them to surgery, and what I try to do is see whether or not gene expression profiling on the biopsy predicted adverse pathology, Gleason 3, disease of primary pattern 4 or 5. And if you simply looked at the CAPRA score, it, it showed the likelihood of favorable pathology relatively well. But if you had gene expression profiling to this, what you sh showed is that you could, within a single CAPRA or risk category, you could further substratify patients. So these are independent predictors beyond Gleason grade, PSA, and T stage. And you'll probably double or triple the number of patients who may be candidates for surveillance using these assays. So we use them routinely. However, they don't correlate well with MRI. So we looked at MRI uh, grading, and uh, this was just GPS. We, looked at, we took different uh, pathways out of it, and the correlation is not uh, very well. So this seems to be giving us two different complementary bits of information. Uh, I always say lifestyle was a teachable moment uh, on this one. So we've actually done a lot of lifestyle studies, of well-funded men on active surveillance, serial genome, gene testing on surveillance. And uh, you know, the number one cause of death in men with prostate cancer is cardiovascular disease. So again, we see this detection of low-risk disease as a teachable moment. We have this, uh, St uh, Stacy Kenfield, who um, got a first R01, is actually one of our uh, young assistant professors, has got this web-based behavior randomized trial, which is quite nice, uh, where patients get uh, change in lifestyle habits, intervention, blood vitamin E, lycopene, uh, and we'll have the results of this in 2016. But I think this is where things are going. So much of, so much of our, uh, we see so much impact of social media, and cancer will be the next battleground here. Focal therapy, this is really worrying me. You know, the, uh, I was asked to debate someone about focal therapy, and we're seeing a wide, a groundswell of interest in focal therapy. Uh, and in order for this to work, there has to be suitable patients. 
has to be effective. And I, I, for all of, I'm sure the urologists in there are getting these emails from HIFU, uh, people in the community doing it, uh, uh, and the company promoting this, of uh, doing so-called focal uh, HIFU. And uh, this concerns me because we're finally making inroads in active surveillance for low-risk patients, and I don't think we should be using HIFU to treat patients who don't need to be treated. And I'm worried that's going to happen. Uh, and I actually reviewed, I had to debate this at, at the uh, GU ASCO this, this, this year, and uh, we looked at the, the, the entire you know, world's knowledge on uh, focal therapy, whether it be with HIFU or anything else, it was 2,600 patients, most of which who had low-risk disease. The average follow-up was very, very short on these patients. So I looked at our last 100, at the time I looked at the last 100 radical prostatectomies that I did at UCSF to see how many of those patients would have been candidates for focal therapy. That would be they had to have at least in three, four disease, uh, uh, unilateral, with the absence of disease on the other side, or at least in three, three on the other side of low volume. There's only 6% of patients. So again, I, I worry that focal therapy, there'll be a race to treat disease that does not need to be treated. I don't know if you're seeing it down here, but we're seeing a big ad campaign on the West Coast and nationally. Uh, what about high-risk disease? So, you know, we've looked at this several different times now, and this is results from CAPTURE, and I'm showing you here is the CAPTURE score, low versus high. Again, most USA, U.S. patients are down here. I'm looking at uh, cause-specific mortality, and men who've been treated with surgery, radiation with or without hormonal therapy, and ADT. And there's a clear benefit to surgery in men with high-risk disease. And we, we control for every variable known. We could have missed a confounder, but that confounder would have had to add 20 to 40 points to the Catan scale. So that'd be a major confounder. We updated this recently, um, and again, showed the same, uh, same thing, that in fact, surgery appeared to have a benefit for uh, those with high-risk disease. Now, when I trained early on for radical prostatectomy, the patients who were best candidates for surgery we thought were those with low-risk disease. If you had a positive margin, positive lymph nodes, you required salvage therapy, you were criticized. Uh, now, the technique's been refined. Men at high-risk disease appear to benefit the most as part of multimodal therapy. Urologists have to stop being fearful about having high-risk disease detected at the time of surgery. That, that, you know, that would not be a criticism for any other he, uh, human malignancy. So we have to stop apologizing for using radiation therapy or detecting high-risk disease. Uh, so this is my radical prostatectomy series over time. So if you look uh, at less than 2,000, 55% of my patients were low risk. Uh, very few were high-risk disease. And back, go, go to 2014, and if you, even 2016, these numbers are lower. But only 22% of our patients in 2014 were low-risk patients, at least in 3-3 disease. And most of those were high volume 3 3 or ad, uh, abnormal genomic profiling in MRI patients. So we've gone from treating low risk disease to treating high risk disease. I, I can also say that for radiation therapy, we've gotten, we stopped doing uh, external beam alone, uh, IMRT alone, and we do routinely now IMRT plus a high dose radium plant, which I think has a lower risk of in field recurrence rates. I'm fascinated by uh, my, my big thing right now for me is this PET imaging. Uh, uh, so this is uh, novel PET imaging before treatment high, and we're doing it both in high risk and low risk patients uh, to identify, detect local regional disease, identify patients for surveillance. After treatment, time of biochemical relapse to assess response to therapy, and obviously over time, PSMA targeted uh, therapy. And this is our early results using PSMA PET. Are you using this here, Marty, P uh, any PET imaging? So uh, actually, Austin uh, was Okay. Yeah. 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 So we we have it under trial for low risk disease, and then we're just doing the P PYO uh, uh, tracer from Hopkins. We're doing high risk disease, but it does cost patients now sixteen hundred additional dollars to get this test. 
because they're going to pay out of pocket $1,600, but it's been very revealing to us. So if you look at patients with high risk non metastatic disease, they go PSMA PET imaging, you find nodal disease in 40% and bone disease in 7% of patients. And the interesting thing is 42% of the cases with nodal metastases had positive nodes located outside the primary landing site. So we're seeing nodes in areas we, you know, pararectal, presacral, anterior prostate nodes. It's nodal disease we had not really paid much attention to before. Uh, and this was a patient who had disease sitting right behind their uh, uh, external iliac node that I probably would have missed if I didn't have this PSMA pet. It was just sitting right behind the artery. This is a patient with high-risk disease whose PSMA pet was negative with the exception of a supraclavicular lymph node, biopsy positive. We would have never anticipated that uh, before. Uh, so if we look at PSMA PET imaging at time of bowel come up occurrence, again, this is about 130 patients. We got, you know, again, we're trying to biopsy all sites of metastatic disease. We see that the, the, it's negative in 22%, local 21%, regional uh, 26%, distant in about 30%. We were treating blindly before. Hopefully, we're going uh, more focally. This is a patient I operated on who's 75 now, operated in 1994 for PT3 at least in 3-3 disease. Now, we're trying to get his slides back because 3-3 disease is thought never to metastasize. And here's a patient who we've been, PSA was undetectable to, to 2005, so 94 to 2005. PSA has risen consistently since then. A low PSA doubling time, currently 19.1. Sodium fluoride PET, ultrasound imaging, all negative. We get a PSMA PET. He has a Z, he's got uptake in a right hilar lymph node, biopsy positive. We would not have anticipated that uh, before. Uh, this is a patient I just saw this last week, 44-year-old, PSA 28. I, it, it, they just happened to get a PSA on him. Uh, Gleason 4-5, T3A disease. He's got this uh, big uptake in the prostate. You can see here, and he's got this uh, presacral node right here. Uh, I'm taking this patient to surgery. I mean, he, he's, he understands he may need additional treatment, obviously, afterwards, but he's going to surgery. This is a patient who's been seen actually uh, both at uh, Farber, at Memorial, and UCSF. I may, I, may, I may ask Omar how we would treat this patient. Let me go back to that if I can. And uh, again, he was, he's got high grade disease. Uh, and you can see here on his imaging these nodes popping up in his retroperitoneum. Uh, very bright and biopsy positive. And he's gotten several different opinions. I don't know how he would be treated here. I, in Boston, they want to, he's on hormonal therapy, and they're going to give him radiation therapy. It, in New York, he's been seen in Sloan Kettering, where they've advised actually surgery, do, to move the prostate, do an extended lymph, lymphadenectomy, open. He wants my, my opinion. I'm, not quite, I'm kind of in between both of those. It's a lot of, lot of nodes high up. but. Uh, and now, of course, we believe in randomized, I mean, we believe in trials, and this is we're part of the uh, MD Anderson uh, best systemic therapy, best systemic therapy and treatment of primary surgery radiation therapy. So we're trying to roll these patients into a, to a, to a study. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this. Omar will go see you all this. You live this life, more agents, more tailoring being done. Uh, I'm going to give you three examples of things I found very interesting recently. And of course, this is, you're all familiar, this is how it shares work on uh, uh, ARV7 positive circulating tumor cells in response to taxanes and um, secondary uh, or abiraterone and zalutamide. And what he found, again, these are looking, there's about 250 patients, about 161, if, if I recall correctly, who are eligible for this, about 193 uh, samples uh, looking at these uh, expression on circulating tumor cells. And what he showed was that, in fact, the ARV7 presence predicted response to secondary hormonal therapy or taxane. So if you were ARV7, you had a much better response to taxane-based therapy. And again, they adjusted for all preclinical risk profiles. Uh, and I thought this was quite interesting. I don't, and again, this, this is not new because we reported, I think, in the New England Journal about a year ago as well, that this idea that you can use pre-therapy biomarker expression and determine who might be best be treated with uh, systemic therapy. Uh, I was also interested in this from uh, Pete Nelson at ASCO uh, this last year. It looks, you know, these inherited mutations in genes that regulate DNA repair, BRC1 and 2, uh, uh, 
how associated with increased risk of developing advanced prostate cancer. We always knew that, and we thought the, the likelihood of a, of a germline change it would be about four to six percent. But he showed that in the, the frequency of germline DNA repair gene mutations uh, was actually much higher by 11.4 percent in men with advanced disease, suggesting that the testing these men may be uh, uh, may be very important because obviously they may be a candidate for response to cisplatinum or PARP inhibitors. Uh, the other thing we're doing at UCSF now, which is being done both commercially and in sites of these using these mouse avatars, are using these here at the Emory at all. This, so what we're doing now really based a lot of our work on pet imaging is we're taking these, these doing these patient-derived xenografts, PDX uh, xenografts in men with high-risk disease. We're, we're implanting them in, in mice to look at uh, differential gene expression, looking for, this is being done really as part of research uh, protocols, but there was a very well circulated article about a woman uh, in, um, I think, New York who paid tens of thousands of dollars to have this done um, uh, for laryngeal cancer, and they found that they, they were able to detect by PDX a, 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 a gene to, uh, in a uh, you know, targeted therapy. So we're actually doing both the primary and the, uh, the metastases. These are in high risk patients. These are just a couple examples that you can see protein expression profiling of actionable pathways. The PRC here is, is me, it's not, these are not my tumor samples, but these are patients that I've operated on that we've gone and uh, grown these. And actually, they're growing quite well. It's expensive to do, but I think this is, this is a whole area of, uh, of interest. Treatment trends are changing. We reported this in JAMA recently, Matt Cooperberg and I. So for low risk disease, uh, we saw that until up to 2009, a very low risk of a low usage of active surveillance increased rapidly during that time period. Again, I hope that's not threatened by focal therapy. We also saw an in, a decreasing rates of radiation therapy for intermediate and high-risk disease and increasing rates of surgery. Whether well, that's good or bad or not is not for me to say, but we are seeing increasing rates of surgery for intermediate and high-risk disease and surveillance for low-risk disease. So my final thoughts is that prostate cancer is a spectrum of disease, and we should assess it and treat it as such. We shouldn't put these. I don't like this three categories. I certainly don't like two categories. Uh, we should match the treatment of the patient and his cancer. All treatment options require greater scrutiny in terms of their outcomes, functional onco oncologic, and their cost and appropriateness. And, uh, and I think Marty and Raj would, and everyone else, would, uh, Chris, would agree with this. We need to begin collecting, disclosing patient-reported, risk-adjusted outcomes prospectively across multiple treatment modalities, facilities, and individual providers. It takes a lot of work and a lot of money, but it should be done. And we need to develop, validate, and use novel technology appropriately. And I tell you, if urologists want to remain uh, the primary purveyor of care for these patients, they have to, they have to pay attention to these, these final thoughts. Uh, and lastly, I, I, this is really work of many people. I, I like uh, Emory, UCSF is a great place to work, great people across specialties. And this presentation would not be possible without all these people to help put it together. Thank you very much.